Hello and welcome to uh, my channel, Real Life Matters with Sandra. I've got a wonderful guest with me and I'm going to ask my guest to introduce herself. Over to you, my dear. Oh, hello, Sandra. Uh, my name is Reverend Doreen Kofi williams I'm an ordained Methodist minister um, stationed in the um, West Midlands area. So before we go into uh, what you're currently doing as a reverend, I want you to take us back slightly to your journey to becoming a reverend. It could be either your paid job, as in like the circular job that you were doing before, right up until the time you became a reverend. Yes, well, that was quite quite a journey, and that journey still continues. But um, I was a civil servant. I started off um, by mid '90s at the Department for Education and Skills then, and then ended up at Ministry of Justice, which was Department for Constitutional Affairs. Um, but during that time, um, I gained an interest, having been born a, a Catholic. Christian, you know, but I, I, I gained an interest in um, studying the Bible just by virtue of, of my journey, you know, I was a, a lady in waiting, waiting on the Lord for, for a child. And um, that took me down many avenues, you know, of prayer and prayer meetings and conventions, you know, and um, I developed this love and, and some of it was by just sheer direction of the how God speaks to us through the Bible and also to study how God answers prayer by looking at our ancestors that have gone before us. And so that love for the Bible and that strong faith that developed that um, my answer will come from the Lord kind of shifted me from not just being this lady in waiting, but just being this prayerful person. Mm. And yeah, so um, that developed and um, belonging to several prayer meetings and, you know, denomination was not an issue for me. I was just going everywhere and anywhere in search mm. of God. And um, eventually we moved from London to Kent and then moved again within Kent and um, looking for our local Methodist church. We found it, and on this day we arrived, and we arrived late because we struggled to find it, myself and my husband. And we, we got in eventually, and uh, my husband being a chorister gifted with, with an amazing voice, we were at the back and we just got into the singing. And at the end of the service, an elderly gentleman turned around and says, how blessed have I been to, you know, being sat before you, you know, who are you to my husband and who are you to me? And we introduced ourselves that we quite knew it was our first day and um, we made friends and um, he invited us for, for dinner um, and with another couple and we sat round table and we started to talk and the question of how the Muslim religion came about came and everyone was talking and eventually I think my, my knowledge of studying the Bible on how God has blessed women with children kicked in. Mm. And I talked about um, Hannah, you know, yes, and, and Elkanah, and I talked about um, and Sarah, you know, and Abraham. Um, I was just talking and, and obviously it was Sarah and Abraham, you know, and, and Ishmael and Isaac that had, had the answer to the question that was, was spoken around the table. And that, um, it was a retired minister um, said to me, um, Doreen, do you realize that um, you've done an amazing exegesis? Well, at that time, I had no clue what exegesis Exactly. Meant. What does it mean? <laughs> and I said, what does that mean? And he said, the way you explained the Bible just now, the way you explained that passage about Sarah, you know, and Ishmael and Isaac, you know, uh, it, it's it's just um, so very clear and, and very, you know, and kind of captivating. You could have been easily um, been preaching. Have you thought of being a local preacher? Well, at that time, my husband, who has had his own issues with me, just 
going around churches and going, you know, in different parts of the country, chasing after different pastors coming from different parts of the world, you know, in in in, in want of my needs, um, had always said to me, because by then other ministries were developing with me, you know, the prayer mm-hmm. ministry, I find myself um being led or people coming to me to pray for them when in fact i needed you know my prayer pray yourself pray, yeah prayer myself so i'd had prayer ministry going without even knowing it was a ministry you know so my husband has seen that and says why don't you do that in a methodist church and where you know you'll be able to get accreditation and get something you know authentic going uh, i wasn't listening so he saw that as a moment to to press on me a bit and um we came home and he says why don't you ring this person and say say yes and i barely got towards the phone the phone rang and said oh he said um i just ring to to ask you the conversation the question i asked you last night mm-hmm. would you consider being a local preacher and i said well actually i was just going to ring you and long story short next thing i know i was sitting in his front room with the superintendent minister being interviewed i was enrolled on to be a local preacher and the journey started as well in the methodist church to be a, an ordained to train to be an ordained minister you the prerequisite is to have been an accredited local preacher so the journey started not knowing that i will ever be a minister i just wanted this accreditation and that would be it yeah <laughs> that, that's really interesting so you didn't start off saying oh wow i'm gonna be a minister there was no, no light bulb moment light no. bulb moment to say i want to be a minister this is no. the clear path i want to go i because that's god calling me yeah it didn't no, have it, that no i didn't have that the calling clearly for the preaching you know the calling clearly for you know that prayer ministry you know that that serving ministry you know the love for god was there and that could have been just that you know and then um not too long into it's quite a long process i don't know i think this the the, the training for local preachers is changed now but in my time um it was five years you know unless if yeah. if you haven't got anything to do you know you can you just focus on that and then you can be for three years it was still a long you know so for me it was clearly five years you know so and, was it um, five years part-time part three time. years full-time if yes if you can give a full-time time to it you know and then it's three, three years yes i was working you know I, I was i was at ministry of justice then and everything else that was going on Mm. and um, I started you know I went through all the different processes you got to a point where you go with someone to preach you know you go with someone you kind of like an understudy and bit by bit as you as you are um, passing your modules you're moving up you know a level mm. and you get to a point where you can go now on on your own you know prepare your service without it being checked and just turning up as the preacher even before accreditation. So all of that is taken into consideration as you're completing your portfolio for accreditation. So was I it started daunting? Going, Sorry, dear. Was, it, was it daunting for you the first time you did it? Oh, yes. <laughs> Shaking, you know, and making obvious mistakes where I've clearly put the hymns down as, for example, hymn number 367. But when I come to say it, I'm telling them it's 673, you know. <laughs> skipping hymns <laughs> forgetting the lord's prayer oh wow you know, the, the voice is shaking you know you get there and then eventually the nerves dies down but everyone always say and i still say if if a preacher does beat a, a local preacher or minister does not get the nerves before the start then you know you have to so the nerves never goes away but it's just on a different level the tension is different you know mm. is it is so, it better as the years has gone by because you know your stuff you know what to expect you yeah. prepared yourself you more yeah. experienced is that why it's, it's much better or do you have copy mechanisms that you've put in place to help you yes the the, the, the both i'll say yes to both um understanding more you know um the rudiments of of um, preparing a service it's not anything that is kind of um 
shocking or scary anymore you know and then um I, I think for me again there's a part of of the love of preparing the service the love of preparing the scriptures the research takes over mm. and then once i put my sermon together including prayers what takes over again is the buzz to go and share it yes that buzz to go and share it's almost like come and hear you know have you heard you know come and hear what i've got to share you know what the look because for me when i when i when i prepare my sermon when i do my my research my study it's almost as if i'm done preaching to myself you know and so i'm not coming to tell the congregation how to live their life i'm coming to share with them how we ought to be because myself you know by the time i finish i'm i'm so convicted you know and and that is why i get very excited to go and say if i'm if i'm convicted <clears throat> excuse me then truly somebody else will be convicted absolutely you know absolutely yeah. so where does the topic come from the the theme the subject you're going to preach on week yeah. on week where do you where do you get that inspiration from yes as um methodist and i believe the same also perhaps for, for anglican and uh, you know other um um denominations Baptist. that are formalized you know yeah the the lec the which called lectionary reading is get selected for us you know by the 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 calendar you know the christian according to the christian calendar you know oh, I see. yeah all the times you know seasons mm -hmm. and times influence the, the the bible study the gospel reading you know we, we call it the lectionary mm -hmm. however except if, if it's not the season and times whereby if it's not a Bible reading that is geared towards Easter and you're preaching something else, everybody's going to say, what's wrong with this? Exactly. You know, exactly. Have, you, so, have you missed the memo? <laughs> yes, the message, yes. But if it's what we call ordinary times, meaning, you know, there's nothing in the Christian calendar and, it, you, that, and, and the lectionary is there, but it's there as a guide, the minister is free to choose their own Bible passage as they feel inspired, mm. yeah. So That's we do brilliant. have a lectionary that we are guided with the Old Testament, the New Testament, you know, the gospel, the epistle, it's all there. Mm, yeah. Fantastic. So as a wife, a mother and a reverend, you know, looking after God's people, how do you balance all of this on a day to day basis? How do you do it? <laughs> Sandra, it's not mean feet, it's hard. <laughs> Tell us about um, it. It's it's hard, you know. Um, when I started off, I said my my journey was because I was a lady in waiting. <clears throat> what I didn't say was that I think about two or three years into my training as a local preacher, I had my first child, hmm. and that was some fifteen years after being married. Wow, so then I had to stop the local preachers' training to go you know look after the child and all of that then i went and completed so by the time i completed and went back all the people were saying when i mean people you know the different churches as a methodist we have circuits so we go across several churches on a rotor basis so we're right. not just in one church so a circuit like for kent has the, the the one of the largest circuits so you can the circuit starts from like that foot goes all the way to beyond maidstone so on a rotor basis, I visited those all those churches, you know, and the feedback was that, oh, when you're coming, we don't even think you're a local preacher. We always think you're a reverend, you know, and the question and the pressure was being put at the top that why don't you allow this lady to just fast track? She's mm -hmm. already, you know, we can see she already has the calling, you know, so it was never agreed on to the glory of God because maybe God knew I needed to really yes. go around all the, the corners, you know? Yes. And and so um, finish that, then the question came again, would you consider being a minister? You know, and by then I've had my own um, calling made manifest through my dreams, you know, through God mm. talking to me, you know, through word of knowledge of people who had nothing to do with me, doesn't they don't even know me, you know, all professing that, you know, the Lord has called me into ordained ministry. And and 
and then the minister at the church the superintendent at the time which was diff different now to the superintendent that signed me on as a local preacher also came and, and said to me this is what the lord is saying you know would you come and candidate as you know a, a, a for, for ministerial role you know and so that's how i started and it was very long and tedious and I went through the selection process, which is about three stages of different paneling. Very, very tedious, an academic portfolio, extremely tedious. And um, to the glory of God, I was accepted unanimously. And then I went on to, to, to um, theological college and I left my, my, my son, he was only in year two, and my husband, and I stayed for, for the week and come home at weekends for two years. Wow. It was very hard. To the glory of God, I, I was successful and then got sent to the Midlands as a probationary minister. And a <laughs> few months to going into um, facing panel that will determine me going, being accepted for ordination, I was blessed with a child. Oh, amazing. Child number two. Child number two. <laughs> History repeated itself. Yes, yes. You know? So I've been very, very busy, you know, looking after, you know, my husband, um, two kids, you know, a, a brand new baby, and of course the ministry and all through lockdown, which was a blessing because it means I could work from home, you know, I carried on taking my services from home, you know, because we had those 18 months to two years when everything was online, Christmas and Easter, that was a blessing, you know, and to tell you, I have a very supporting stewards as well, you know, and trusted ones, you know, that come with, to be with the family mm. and help, you know, and, and family members. But me on my own is taken, it's taken all the skills as, as, as an old civil servant. <laughs> organizational <laughs> skills organizational skills back Project in the day planning. When, when we used cabinets time management yes time management you know and and to be honest with you um it's also part of ministry part of what god trains us to is to is to be easy on ourselves it's not to create such a high standard that we we trip ourselves and by that what i mean is that there are things that i have to learn to let go of yes i choose my battle mm. you know there are things that i say well if that is there and it's not done that's fine you know and if if i if i don't do that within this week that is fine so bit by bit, I just learned to reorganize myself and be gentle on myself, knowing that where I was five years ago, where I was 10 years ago, that's not where I am now. Mm -hmm. And how many people will walk in my shoe? I haven't dropped anything. I've had a child. I've, I stayed in full-time ministry. I went to panel. I, I was unanimously recommended for ordination, you know. I've never missed a Sunday, you know. My, my son and my husband are cared for. My husband, you know, is uh, extremely supportive, you know. And the other things that we add on the pressure, I'm learning to, to identify, well, if I haven't done the ironing, so what? Yes. Yeah. So you basically know? you were giving yourself permission to let some things go. Yes. Because it's not the end of the world if they're no. not done. No. Mm. And it's quite hard because um, those are things where that, you know, you'll never find me wanting on, you know, and especially yes. I haven't kept a home for so long with no yes. child. I spend my time cleaning and packing and ironing and cooking umpteenth, you know, and wanting everyone to come and eat because there's so much food, you know, entertaining all the time. And all those things have to curb and coming into ministry has helped because I need so much time to study you know I yeah. need so much time for my pastoral you know if it's not funeral it's somebody that is ill you know it's one evening service you know it's two services per Sunday you know and uh -huh. it's all the other administrative work that comes with it now it's not just church you know so I have to to choose 
and pro- reprioritize and prioritize mm-hmm. and feel okay about it because my situation is exceptional yes. and God has chosen me for it. Yes. God has yes. chosen me for it and I'm grateful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some people might say, it's all right for you to say that God has chosen it for me. God wants me to do this. God wants me to do that. I'm doing this for God. Some might say, well, that's all well and good for you to say that as a reverend. But some people might say, how do you know that God exists? How do you know? How does anyone know? Yeah, it's it's an individual thing. That is why it's an it's a relationship that we choose to have. And my experience will be different from yours and sometimes when we share our experiences we find one or two will 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 be identical you know we will we, we cross wires you know somewhere along the way because god is the same you know but i know that god exists because my my journey in life has not allowed me to rest on my on my my christian found on the laurels of my christian foundation being that i come from a a a christian background you know i was reading lessons in church when i was a child you know was selected to read lessons in church when i was a child and and the the priest used to put a stool for me to stand up so i can get to the microphone (laughs) you were that tiny (laughs) <laughs> yes, you, you you know you know me now. <laughs> um, so it started very early than even where I started that you know my journey. So every time I think, I I all I go back one notch. Every time I think, I go back one notch. That this really started, you know, from even my childhood. There was always a connection. You know, there was always something. I was always the child who will come up with something that my parents will say, "Who told her that?" You know. But I always have that connection and and I will not shy away because I want to know that I, I want to believe I hear from God because I don't want to hear from anything else, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, but um, God speaks and God speaks to me, you know, and, and, and I'm blessed with having amazing God dreams, you know, and so none of my children came out of the blues per se you know like my second child every more virtually for like six odd months every morning i wake up i say to my husband look at my age i'm dreaming someone giving me a child you know i'm dreaming someone giving me a child so every journey god has you know god has spoken to me or someone else has spoken god god's message into me you know or to me but I know God exists because I have a relationship with God where I hear from God and 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 with humility. You know, I'm not professing, you know, one of what's going on out there. I'm saying, you know, with humility, you know, God God calls me. When I mean God calls me, he, God pulls me into that place and speaks to me. So personal relationship. And it's a personal relationship and it has never been wrong, either on behalf of people, for people, and especially on behalf of people and for people. Never been wrong. And time and time again is always a big surprise, you know. It's like, how does she know? You know, or how do I did I know? I didn't know, you know, I'm seeking God myself. But I know God exists. I look at the world. I know God exists. I'm Sandra. I've just finished taking a funeral. And in the height of that pain, Mm. something will be said either by me um, um, through the the history of what has been shared by the deceased. And you see that wife or that daughter or that mother that is so heartbroken, so crushed, you think, will this person survive the night? You see them laughing. Mm. And that is God. God, he walks alongside us. God walks alongside us. So in the midst of our trouble, you see someone who, they, they look like really and truly, any minute they're going to have a heart attack because of grief. And then the next minute, something is said about their loved ones. You know, some memory is shared in the same service, in the same way, and they burst into laughter. And even though I'm leading the service, and I'm so focused, but in my mind, I'm saying, God, this is you. Mm. This is you that this person was laughing two seconds ago, you know, and in the world during this pandemic, 
we, we live we live in a world now where people's choices are so great and and so diverse and and everyone is so free to say i believe in myself you know i i make things happen because of me you know and all of that but when the pandemic came whether they they, they profess to do it for christ or not for christ look at how people rally around each other mm. absolutely and look at how we're still it's going wonderful. yeah of yeah. you know whatever is around the corner whatever we are still going you know and we've lost i know many people personally you know still on my phone that have died of covid mm. Mm. you know and these families are still going because they have trusted in the lord but even those who perhaps have another you know religion and those who will say i don't believe or i know there's a being there you whatever it is i believe that god is with us mm. that the end is real is god is real god mm. is real that the end will come but we need to go through this because if if the bible was still continuing this will be this will make a page a mm. chapter a book in the bible so life is continuing past revelation but there's yeah. nothing new under the sun absolutely absolutely there's nothing new so we're just mm. going through everything mm. we've read in the bible this is our season our time to witness a plague it's mm. our time mm. but then what what do we do and what should we do we as christians people of the christian faith and everyone you know to their own but i speak as a minister this is not time when we say god where are you mm. this is when we say father walk with us be mm. with us and thank god for the wisdom of those people who so quickly came up with those vaccine mm. isn't that god mm -hmm. you know we use the word clever smart genius that has to be God. It has to be God. And so you remind me when God says, you know, um, put put the put the blood of the lamb, you know, over your door. Absolutely. Yes. And so when the plague comes, you pass it, it over. It pass it over. And mm. this is the vaccine. And so you know, the other there was at the hairdressers, and this lady said, "Oh, I have not taken the vaccine." And I, and I said, "Why? Oh, I'm washed by the blood." And I said, "Do you know how many ministers who will have?" 400 people minimum in their service have died this is mm. the blood of the lamb take the vaccine so when the plague will come by the special grace of god it will pass over. as you buy it will pass over mm. you know mm. god is with us a new season is coming sandra mm. a new mm. revival Mm. And my prayer is that the church be a part of that revival. Amen. That the church, because more people who are not church-centered or church-focused are beginning to see that indeed, back to your question, ah, there is a God. There is a God. And how do we bring God center again to our community, mm -hmm. to our society? So we don't want people who are not church-centered, the church-focused, to come and bring this revival and run with it, and the church is still doing tradition and still doing, you know. We want our eyes to be open and to be a part of the revival because after every plague, there's a new season. Yes, yes. There's a new season. Yes. And we want to be a part of it to the glory of God. We mm. want to be a part of it. Amen. So I believe God exists. I believe. Thank you. Thank you. So who is your favorite person in the Bible and why? Oh, my favorite person in the Bible, mm. obviously, is Hannah for Samuel. Right. <laughs> and that is why I have a, a, a very early on in, in, when WhatsApp group started, I have a, 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 a women's ministry that is whatsapp based purely and i have women in, in in different parts of the world are on it called hannah sanctuary mm. amazing hannah sanctuary where you know put prayers you know and just bless people with prayers and um 
the prophetic and the prophetic is not telling people you know the future but the prophetic in that let the scriptures speak prophetically proclaim the good news that cheers people up you know and so i love hannah because for samuel the scripture says her adversary provoked her soul because mm. elkanah was having children with penina mm. because he if he, he he buckled under the pressure as a man to have children because year by year they go up to the temple to offer their sacrifices and the bigger the man's family the more the more gra gravitas you know <laughs> gets from from the community <laughs> so he had a, he, he had penina producing kids but he loved the scriptures he loved anna the most mm. and when anna will be tearful elkena will say to hannah why are you sad am i not more than you know 10 sons am i not more than mm. four sons two sons you know and then when the time came for hannah she went up to the temple and she was just talking to herself and herself and lamenting and the high priest saw hannah and says woman at this time of the morning why are you drunk, drunk. she says i'm not drunk my lord but my heart is body and my heart is soul mm. mm. and the lord spoke and samuel amazing yeah and having walked that journey sometimes we're indeed provoked physically sometimes we provoke ourselves because we put ourselves under pressure too yeah but it's the steadfastness of hannah mm. the steadfastness of hannah for hannah to 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 have stood still for god to have god's way with her at the end of the day when all seemed to have been lost and so for me that's why you know i i named my, my ministry hannah's sanctuary i encourage women it doesn't matter who you are what you are what you're going through are you single you know are you married do you have children do you birth them do you adopt them whatever you're coming from you know uh, you know are you um, disability whatever it is hannah's sanctuary is there to say stand stand and let god decorate you in god's way it doesn't have to be your way but allow god to take you to that 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 mountain of peace and that mountain of peace may mean you may never birth children mm. how does one deal with that though because i'm sure no doubt there will be women many women thousands millions oh, yes. of women out oh, there yes. how how, oh, yes. how can they cope on a day-to-day -day basis it is, it their is, peers. yes it is how it is difficult you know uh, talk about society people family you know all put pressure on 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 the woman you know it's usually the woman isn't it put mm. pressure on the woman and the woman also putting pressure on on herself you know mm. it's it's a it's a long and deep journey that allows us women when we find ourselves in that situation to get to that point to allow god to be god because you get to that point when you realize that money cannot even do this thing <laughs> you know mm -hmm. love cannot do this thing you know what else now well let god be god and how god can be god sometimes cultural barriers you know sometimes you know our own our own context you know can, can prevent allow god maybe if you can't birth it's adoption and some people will say i don't want somebody else's child because they are not my blood especially in our culture yes well do you know how many <laughs> how many women will birth children and before they leave this world the children would have left mm. Mm. so birthing a child or birthing children is one thing 
but not all women who have birthed children have enjoyed motherhood and some of them have birthed and you know god forbid and and quite unfortunate those situations are so troublesome you know that those mothers have never stopped crying you know things have gone so wrong and so bad and you have some women who have opened their hearts to say well i have not birth but i'm going to adopt and they have received love you wake up in the morning and the child calling you mommy and looking up to you for substance you know for love and your name is changed in fact when you when you take that child to nursery or to school your name is changed you know mm. you are if the child's yeah, name mommy. is mary yeah, mary's mommy if the if the if it's a boy his name is david david's mommy you say oh i'm a mommy you know you're going to christmas place you're going to um, children's parties your mommy and that child or those children will will always have no matter what down the line you will always be mommy because you you know you sustain them mm. the joy of motherhood will find you he settles the barren woman to be a joyful mother of children and to keep house it is real but how do we change society to believe that that is acceptable it's in our preaching as well mm. i think some of the preaching that could make a, a couple a man or a woman you sit in church 30 years pastor says mm. Mm. when we start even as ministers as pastors encouraging people do you know how many people have adopted and, and later on gone to have birth children. Yeah, yeah. We hear about those stories, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So we need to bring it into our mainstream and stop, you know, leading people as if to say the only miracle that God does is to is is to um create conception. Well, God has created conception because that child has been conceived. Just but not through God, that individual. Yes. But then God has chosen you and if you go through the adoption process even you know it is such a miracle that that child most 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 family will tell you most couple will tell you that child either looks so much like the adopted mother mm. or looks so much like the adopted father so much and the bond and the union it, it's almost as if god has just passed this child through another channel because maybe god is saving you some women get pregnant they go to give birth they never come back you never know mm. it's for us to make it mainstream that god is using other people to bless if you find yourself that is why the scripture says he settles the barren woman to be a joyful mother of children and to keep house he settles the barren woman settles mm. you know so we need to bring it into our preaching we need to bring it into our teaching we need to bring it all those miracle working pastors we need to bring it that the miracle is finding being matched with that child it's a miracle mm. and you think ah, the child even have gap tooth like me <laughs> oh this child looks so much like my husband this child looks so much like me it is a miracle and we have to start looking at it like that and mm. embracing that so many children are looking for mothers and fathers mm. and some of those children are, are, are lawyers they are doctors they are successful business people they are teachers they're going to be midwives and nurses you know they're going to be athletes they're going to be some of them will be millionaires you wish you had adopted them because th those children carry destiny too. Absolutely. They carry, those children Absolutely. carry mantle. They carry mantle. You want them in your home. We dispel all this, especially some of our, our culture, you know, that that demonizes those, those, those situations of those children. You know, let us know better. Mm. 
let us know better. Mm. So what ki- so the last 18 to 20 months mm. have been very, I mean, you said that earlier as well, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, have been very challenging to mm-hmm. everybody in the world because this yeah, is not yeah. just limited to one continent or country. It's mm-hmm. the whole world that's been enveloped by this COVID-19 yeah. pandemic, you know. How have you motivated yourself to carry on despite all of that, doing funerals after funerals and having to visit people because they've mm-hmm. lost their loved ones? And mm-hmm. how have you motivated yourself? Again, or who, yes. Or who has motivated you? First of all, it's, it's the mantle that I carry mm. of being called to serve God's people. So it's all, it's almost so much as, again, my children, I wake up in the morning, I want to do right by them. I want to make sure they are fed, you know. I want to make sure they're emotionally well and balanced, you know. I want to make sure they're clean. I want to make sure they're okay. And I make sure my husband is okay as well. And so be, being a minister is I wake up in the morning and I think, I am don't have to go into the office. I've done that for 20 odd years. Mm. God has called me to listen to these mm. people, to journey alongside them, to go and be with them, you know, you know. So how can I do this? And honestly, once I get ready and I put on my clerical clothing, a new lease of life come on. Mm. I'm always excited, even though sometimes it's a sad situation. But it doesn't matter how sad the situation is, walking alongside and even taking a funeral and seeing it to the end there's some sort of um, humble gratification that comes that I feel like, thank you, Lord, for equipping me to support this family. Thank you, Lord. So for me, it's the it's the, 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 the weight of the anointing, you know, and the responsibility, the accountability that keeps me going to say, I need to be there for them, you know? I need to be right for God because this is what God has called me to do. I can't, you know, I can't play with it. it it's, it's, it's a calling, you know, it, it's nothing else other than a calling. And every time I put myself out, I feel God's peace. Mm. I feel God's peace. So do you so that, work with other, I, thank you. Do you work with other ministers? I don't we, know we how it works in Methodist, but do you yes. work with other local ministers, regional yeah. or national ministers? How does it work? Yes, well, because sometimes yes. they can they can support each other as well, can't they? Yeah, we do. Support yes. and encourage each other. How does it work? Yes, well, we we have um, the Methodism. I, I talked about um, going around and preaching on a road basis in what is called a circuit, and that mm-hmm. can be as as large as geographically or as small as. Mm-hmm. Well, um, my circuit is Coventry and Nuneaton circuit, and the district is Birmingham, so as big as you know. Mm. Um, we have a team. So the, the, within the district, you have various circuits. So um, geographical um, boundaries have been fused together to form a circuit. And within that circuit, I have a superintendent and I have two other um, ministers and one deacon and myself and we have an LEP um, meaning um, it's another denomination that that's has, a lay preacher no it's an is an ordained that's an ordained minister from another denomination okay. that works jointly with the Methodists so the, you know it's, it's like a joint mm. you know kind of um, a fusion kind of um, um, thing going on you know, um, 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 what should I say, union of, of fellowship. So we have that from time to time when you have a Baptist minister, you know, um, serving 20% of their time with with, with the Methodist. It's called um, LEP, so that kind of mm-hmm. local arrangement kind of thing, you know, ecumenical partnership. Economic, is yes. The word. Local ecumenical partnership is the word. And then we have local preacher, which is what I was, you know. So we have local preachers as well, where we, we share in, in, in leading worships. You know, because 
one minister can only be in one church at, at a time. Indeed. And several <laughs> other churches. So we have local preachers who also, but of course, us the ordained minister, when it's communion, we are at the churches to take communion services, you know. So, so we share, we have staff meeting where we share our burdens, we share our worries, we pray together, you know, we talk about ministry. Yeah, we do, yeah. Mm. And then we have synod, um, the district synod where we, we meet, which is like our little parliament where we, <laughs> we go through our regulations, you know, our doctrines and, and, and all the, the wider admin, you know, and also mm. prayer and, and decisions are being made prayerfully and all that, yes. Mm. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. So. So do you have a favorite hymn? Ah. I I I said a prayer this morning. All I have needed thy hand has provided. God is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. And sometimes when I'm I'm tired, but well not tired, when I wake up in the morning and I haven't even like put myself together. And great is thy faithfulness, oh Lord. My. You know, it's a prayer. Mm. I wake up in the morning and I say, Great is thy faithfulness, oh Lord. Mm. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand, thy hand has provided. Has provided. Great, great is thy, is thy faithfulness, faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Yes. How wonderful. How amazing. Yeah. How amazing. You seem to be doing quite a lot. How do you rest? How do you rest? How do yes. you relax? What do you do to relax? Well, um, I have one day off in the week. Okay. Yes, one day off. We all do, you know, ministers. And then we have what you call um, quarter days where our, our, our preaching plan um, is, is, is quarterly. Mm -hmm. So within those three months, we should, um, is in our doctrine, our constitution, I should say. <clears throat> Excuse me. We should take three working days off. It's called quarter days to rest. But also, to be honest with you, this work is is rolling. Mm. If if the landline rings, I know it's got to do with work. You know, because mm -hmm. it's a vicarage, it's a man, so, You know, it's got to do with work. So if my my phone rings on on my on a Monday on a day I'm having a quarter day, as long as I'm here, I find it difficult not to pick up because it could be someone. In, wants to talk to me you know mm. I don't want to find out such and such things so bad has happened because the person ran the, the minister and, and she wasn't there, she wasn't there. you know yeah so I um, you know I, I find my time we go on holiday when we when you know when we have holidays you know and and resting is something that I've just learned to, to do in between <laughs> you know because such is the nature of the calling yeah. You can't you can't come home and say it's five o'clock now. Mm. So how does yeah. your husband and your children how do they cope with all of that? You know. But to be honest with you, I'll have to say like for the last two years since we we've, we've been you know um, I started my station in as it's called um, twenty nineteen. I think it's been a shock. Mm. It's been a shock because I've always been. So together, you know, domestically, so together as a wife, you know, uh, um, um, we think together, you know, I, I, I take on his, take over his thoughts, you know, and have the answers, you know, we, we're team Finish and, his sentence and, for him. Oh, yes, you know, <laughs> food is superfluous, is there, my, my, my son, all his clothes and uniform and everything is ironed and put in the, in the, in order pristinely, you know, everything and the shock is that in the evening i'm in the study because there's meetings especially with zoom now there's meetings going on and some meetings can go until about 10 pm and he's upstairs giving the, the kids their back and putting them to bed and before pandemic i would be in the church somewhere within the circuit there's about 30 minutes to 40 minute drive you know and wow. coming home and the kids are in bed and it's taken a lot of adjustment, yes. you know, and sometimes I have no choice. I'm in the study till 2 a.m. just so that I can, you know, plan my service, turn things around or respond to admin, fill forms, fill dates. There's a lot of administrative work as well, you know, and it's taken a lot of adjusting, you know, mm. but I, I think we're, we're getting there. 
That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And we would like to just say thank you to Mr. Williams, actually, yes. for, for the support that he's given yes. you over thank the years you. and continue yes. to do that. And I pray that God will continue to strengthen you both um, and, 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 and be with you and your children as well. Amen. So my, my, my reflection now really is, is to ask you what advice you would um, give to people who are struggling um, because of one challenge or another, it could be anything mm-hmm. that people are struggling with. Uh, what would be your advice or your encouraging word to leave them with? My advice would be, of course, make God the center. You know, make prayer the center. But at the same token, sometimes faith without works is dead, as the scriptures say. Talk to someone. You know, we encourage to have that pastoral relationship. Find, you know, if it's a, a professional help, seek that. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. If it's um, a, a confidante, you know, someone that you know can journey with you, you know, prayerfully, you know, seek that also, you know, and, and embrace that. But do not suffer on your own, you know. Um, pray by all means, you know, um, seek the face of the Lord, but share. Share. It helps, it eases the burden. Mm. And but trust that whatever it is, it shall pass. Mm. The scripture oh. says, This too shall pass, it shall pass. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so God. much, Reverend Doreen Kofi Williams. Thank it's you. been amazing talking to you. You've given us Thank quite you. a lot to, to encourage us, to help us through whatever challenges that we, we face or might face, um, because as, as we're living, there will always be something along the way in our journey that might just kind of be a challenge that we need to deal with. So thank you for helping us to understand how we could focus on God as well and thank seek you so much. help. Yes. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks for having me. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.